Oh, Gavetian. Friends, it's an honour to be back in Scotland with you all, with old friends and with new. And of course, deepening the unique bond between our two parties, supporting and strengthening each other in the process. This is, I am ashamed to admit, uh, my first time in an SNP conference, although I have been a member for a while. It's my second time in Aberdeen, of course, a fantastic, vibrant modern city, and to the untrained ear, it could well be a Welsh city. It would fit in well among our long list of Abers, Aberystwyth, Abertawi, Aberdyfi, Aberdeen. And a long time ago, this place was, of course, a, a Pictish stronghold where the people spoke a language very closely related to Welsh. And today, we all still very much speak the same language, maybe not pedantically, literally, but in culture, in humour, in ideas, in aspiration, in narration. Plaid Cymru and the SNP, just like Wales and Scotland as nations, we understand each other deeply, and I'm honoured to be here strengthening that bond today. Because your fight is our fight, and ours is yours. Diolch and Varian, I'd like to thank you, Diolch, Tapaliv, for the welcome and for the decades of friendship between our parties. Thank you to, to Nicola for your leadership and your determination in government, which is an inspiration to so many of us in Wales. Thank you to Ian and his formidable team in Westminster, who are a constant source of strength and support for our small Plaid group. And I'd like particularly to thank Richard Thompson, who, as your party's spokesman on Wales, backs up Plaid Cymru with gusto during questions to the Secretary of State every month. Secretary of State for Wales. We don't actually know who that might be by the next month. And also, of course, Richard is a virtuoso on the, the trad fiddle, the traditional violin, which I heard last night in Six Degrees North. And to especially a heartfelt thanks to Marion Fellows, who really kindly put me up in her home during COP26 last year. And I do wonder, however, what became of the navigation gin. I don't think there's much of that left. And thank you again to Ian in particular for your eagerness to work together and for always supporting Plaid Cymru's endeavours in Parliament. When Ian takes down the Tories with his scathing, resonant voice, it reverberates not just across the mountains and glens, forgive me the hyperbole, the mountains and glens, glens of Scotland, but across the hills and valleys of Wales too. We like to hear what he says on social media. Now, the, the close cooperation Ian and I have in Westminster dates to those early days back when Gwynver Evans and Winnie Ewing held the fort for us all. They were then surrounded by a sea of blue and red, but they never let them drown their voices out. Thanks to them, our nations have a loud and a clear democratic voice. Back in the 1960s, Welsh Labour MPs refused to speak to Gwynvor. Many refused to even look at him. So deep was their resent at us for taking a seat that they saw, how dare they, as theirs. The entitlement of unionists, eh? And as we face, as we face a crucial Westminster election, let's remind the Westminster parties that no seat belongs to them. As they rant against self-determination, let's remind them that the people of Wales and Scotland owe them nothing. And the SNP has since grown into the gargantuan political force that you are today. When once Plaid Cymru sat in a sea of blue and red, we are now dazzled by SNP yellow. And I'm supposed to say something about Alison Thewlis' out outfit there. <laughs> As we approach the next Westminster election and bring it on, 
I am more determined than ever to bring a brighter dash of Ply Cymru green to our Celtic benches. So budge up and make some more room for the Welsh. And we promise not to sing much. Now, our dealings with Labour in Wales have become, and I was searching for the right adjective here, but I've, I've gone for less barren than they were in Gwynbar Evans' days. They now look at us in the corridor, sometimes, some of them. And since the inception of devolution in 1999, we have worked hard to create a different political culture in Wales, in stark contrast to the petty adversarial nature of politics in Westminster. And we know the people of Wales. They want us to put the Welsh national interest first. That's why we agreed to a historic cooperation agreement with Welsh Government, establishing governance for the common good. This is, of course, a radical counterpoint to the confrontational nature of Westminster politics. Through our agreement, we're rolling out plans to deliver universal free school meals to all primary school children. And we are, I am proud to say, delivering free childcare to all two-year-olds. We committed the government to work towards a publicly owned energy company for Wales over the next two years to expand community-owned renewable energy generation. That, my friends, is the kind of radical 21st century politics Plaid Cymru is delivering in stark contrast to the Victorian throwback Jacob Rees-Mogg and his polluting plans. But of course, it, it wasn't easy. We dragged Welsh Labour kicking and screaming. But thanks, thanks to my colleagues in the Senedd, Plaid Cymru is delivering a better Wales for our children. And it doesn't mean, of course, nonetheless, it doesn't mean we agree with Labour on everything. We don't. We're continuing to push Labour to show the same bold radicalism as shown by your SNP government in Scotland. The SNP freeze rents, Labour promise a white paper. The SNP frees rail fares. Labour finds excuses. The SNP use tax varying powers to protect public services. Labour make a profession of procrastination. Yes, Plaid Cymru and Welsh Labour disagree passionately on many fundamental things, but we do so respectively and constructively. That's part and parcel of grown-up politics in Wales. How depressing it was, therefore, to hear Keir Starmer using his conference speech to rant against the SNP. UK Labour's attachment to an archaic voting system means that in their eyes, you're either with them or against them. Those attitudes should have stayed in the 1960s. <laughs> Keir Starmer, get some perspective. Get real. Know your enemy. The SNP didn't plunge the pound, causing mortgages to soar. Plaid Cymru aren't cutting benefits during an economic crisis to pay for reckless ideological tax cuts. Neither of our parties took away the rights and freedoms of our young people through a destructive Brexit. We say to Keir Starmer, focus on the real monsters. The Tories are the root cause of misery on this island not us. And it's time, it's time for UK Labour to grow up. Look at how we are doing politics differently in Wales and Scotland, and you might just learn a thing or two. And you don't know, you might just need us one day. Yeah. <laughs> and as for the Tories, the Tories just lump us all in one group anyway. The anti-growth coalition, they call us. The only growth Liz Truss is achieving this autumn is that of another coalition, the anti-Tory coalition. People aren't falling for her spin. Tories have trampled over Wales and Scottish communities before, and they are doing so again. Truss's extremist ideology is destroying household incomes in real time, placing yet more strain on families and commun communities that are already stretched to the limit. She's cutting benefits to shovel yet more dosh into the offshore coffers 
of the super rich, forcing the most vulnerable people to bear the brunt of real-time welfare cuts. Wales, I am proud to say, has never, ever returned a majority of Tory MPs. Scotland hasn't done it since 1955. And Liz Truss, she's making sure it's never going to happen ever again. That extremist libertarian ideology we've seen in recent, Wales, in recent weeks has no mandate in Wales or in Scotland, and we will defeat it. She likes her three-word slogans, doesn't she, Liz Truss? Growth, growth, growth. Slogan, slogan, slogan. Words, words, words. Let's start our own. Truss, truss, truss. Out, out, out. And beyond, beyond the three-word slogans, what does trust actually mean by her growth mantra? We're told that massive borrowing for tax cuts and slashing the benefits of struggling families will promote growth. She provides no evidence. She will repeat her latest lie at nauseam because she hopes we'll despair and give up asking. But how? How? A casual culture of, of lying, of casual lying, is pervasive in Westminster politics since the toxic Brexit referendum. If Truss were honest with the public, she would admit that the main government policy damaging economic growth is Brexit itself. And the effects of Brexit are, of course, becoming manifest. OECD figures show that the UK GDP grew by 14.3% between the second and the third quarter, second quarter of 2016 and quarter three of 2021. That's the smallest growth rate, smaller than the four of the EU's largest economies. During the same period, Germany had the highest index growth of 32.2%, followed by Spain, 25.6%, France, 23%, and Italy, 16.3%. If growth is your measure of success, Brexit Britain is scraping the bottom of the barrel once again. In October 2021, the UK government's own Office of Budget Responsibility calculated that Brexit would cost 4% of GDP per annum over the long term. No wonder Truss and Quarteng are suppressing the OBR's latest report. Brexit is hammering the competitive, competitiveness of our businesses. The output of our fishing industry expected to climb by 30%, an industry important to my home community the exact home community of Morven Evin, where I live in Wales, and of course, of course, here in this part of Scotland. Many businesses in my community have stopped trying to sell into the EU due to, Westmin due to Westminster's burdensome red tape. I'd like to invite Liz Trust to my constituency. Try telling those struggling businesses that the Tories are the party of economic growth. Frankly, it's an insult. Both Tories and Labour are deeply committed to the Brexit project. Both are committed to strengthening the horsepower of the economic crisis that's hurtling towards us. For the sake of our economy, we must join the single market and the customs union. Wales marginally voted to leave in 2016, but no one voted for this shock doctrine, for the crazed destruction of industries, for skyrocketing mortgages, or for lower employment rates and environmental safety standards. That's why I am not afraid to tell the truth. Wales belongs to the European family of nations. Scotland, of course, belongs to the European family of nations. We must and we will ensure a brighter future for our children by rejoining the European Union together as independent nations. Now, of course, you'll be familiar with this mantra and so are we in Wales. We're told we're too poor to be independent, too small to run our own affairs. Well, friends, new research by Professor John Doyle of Dublin City University debunks that argument. Time and again, we have heard wild estimates about an independent Wales' likely fiscal gap, the difference between public expenditure and what Wales raises in taxes. Surprise, surprise. Professor John Doyle shows our fiscal gap would be a fraction of what the unionists quoted us. In his words, Wales's fiscal gap is not sufficiently large to close off the possibility of a viable independent Wales. And this shows once and for all that fantasy economics are peddled by those who fear 
our independence. And that's because, friends, and we know this, independence is normal. Chronic inequality under the Union is not normal. And it's our duty to show, isn't it, that independence, this isn't independence for independence sake, it's independence for the sake of a more prosperous economy, wealthier citizens, a more outward looking and confident nation, taking our place among the nations of the world. So, how do we go about achieving that? We must be eagle eyed about the purpose of our shared political project. All of us are in this place here to improve the lives of the people of our respective nations, and we can't work in isolation. Scottish independence, Welsh independence, Irish unity. We are a common movement that exists and strives to build a better future in stark opposition to the vicious inequality at the heart of the United Kingdom. We must therefore act as one for the common good. When Liz Truss says she will face down the separatists who threaten to pull apart our precious union, our family, we know it is not about pulling a family apart. When a family is dysfunctional, it's only right and fair that all the members demand a voice. Let us rebuild this family on an equal footing. And as you approach your independence reference next year, your independence referendum next year, Plaid Cymru will be there alongside you. We will stand with you against the parties of Liz Truss and Keir Starmer and their red, white, and blue jingoism. We will be with you, the people of Scotland, standing up for democracy and self-determination. Last week, I marched with 10,000 people in our capital city in Wales, in Cardiff, in favour, all of us calling for our independence. We are building our nation's economy and institutions ready for an independence referendum too. And when that day comes, I know you also will all be standing alongside us for a fairer, more democratic and more prosperous Wales. Gavetlion, diolch yn fawr iawn. Diolch yn fawr iawn. Thank you very much. Thank you all. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.